everyone, and welcome to the CNBC debate, Asia's energy transition. Asia and the Pacific account for about 80% of global coal consumption and about 60% of carbon emissions. The region itself is already suffering the devastating consequences of climate change. How do we ensure a successful transition to low carbon power here in Asia during these challenging times? Well, to discuss this, my esteemed panelists today, they are Matsusuga Asakawa, President, Asia Development Bank from Manila, Fatih Biro, Executive Director, International Energy Agency from Paris, Mona Lisa Di Malanta, Chair of the Energy Regulatory Commission in the Philippines, and Sindoro Mittal, Vice Chairperson, Avada Group Mumbai. Good to see all of you. Fatih, I would like to begin with you first. Asia as a whole relies heavily on coal for its power generation. And that reliance is increasing because of high energy prices. Can you give us a quick assessment of the current energy markets and how big a challenge that poses for Asia's decarbonization process? Uh, yes, uh, the world, our world is going through it is first global energy crisis. In the past, uh, for example, in the 1970s, we had an uh, oil crisis with a lot of impact on economy uh, and the social uh, life. But now it is not only oil. It is oil, gas, coal, electricity, and around the world. And we have never witnessed such an energy crisis in terms of its depth and in terms of its uh, complexity. And Asia is, of course, not uh, immune to this uh, crisis as a result of being the part of the global energy markets. Asia is affected through high uh, oil prices, high uh, natural gas prices, and also uh, coal uh, prices as well. Now, when you look at the Asian uh, countries, uh, the Asian economies, about 60% of their electricity comes from coal today. And this is never uh, no other part of the world. We have such a high amount of coal having a share in the power generation. Yet, this doesn't help uh, Asia to protect itself from high electricity prices, high uh, oil prices. At the same time, we see that the coal is a major challenge for climate change. And also, let's not forget it, is pollution in the cities and uh, the local uh, pollution. Now, it will be difficult, if not impossible, to tell the Asian countries uh, today, tomorrow you get out of coal and you go to uh, the renewables and others because a uh, huge infrastructure there. But uh, in my view, uh, for the uh, uh, countries in uh, Asia, especially those in developing Asia, they should be very careful to build new coal plants because in the uh, next few years, only because of the economic reasons, they may not be viable options. They may well be standard assets because renewable energies, especially solar, is becoming the cheapest source of electricity generation in Asia and beyond. So my suggestion to the Asian, especially developing nations, uh, is uh, to uh, look at the non-coal options, especially that of renewable energies, and in some countries, nuclear power. They are both uh, net zero emission uh, technologies to, for their uh, power sector, and for uh, the uh, developed countries, uh, the, such as Japan, such as Korea, I think this process should be much faster. President Asukawa, when you hear what Fatih has said about a global energy crisis and his words about uh, Asia and how Asia should move away from coal-fired power plants, at the ADB, you are coming up with an energy transition mechanism. How will that help countries, member countries, accelerate the shift away from coal uh, at a time when there is growing demand and at a time when growing demand for energy is the utmost national security for many countries. How do you suggest they address that? Yeah, thank you for that question on the ETM. Uh, before that, let me just uh, simply uh, tell you that the Asia Pacific region is accountable for more than 50% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. 
it consumes 80% of global coal. And at the same time, it is also true that this region is one of the most uh, vulnerable uh, area, region against natural disaster. And almost 70% of major natural disaster uh, takes place uh, here in this region every year. So our fight against uh, uh, climate change is on the rust. Uh, so th uh, this area uh, need to be decarbonized. Uh, ADB has been working on a couple of innovative financing uh, mechanisms, and ETM is one of them. The issue is as follows. Uh, in this region, there are so many uh, coal-fired power plants already existing and operating, and they are relatively young. Young means less than 20 years old. And 90% of these young uh, coal-fired fired power plants are said to be here in Asia. So unless we don't do anything, uh, we just, uh, uh, they just stay on for another 10 years, 20 years, and even 30 years. So what we should do is to let them retire early, uh, retire earlier than originally scheduled. And ETM would do that job. Uh, ETM is a very inno innovative financing uh, mechanism which combines commercial financing provided by uh, private sector financial institutions with highly concessional uh, financing or even grant money provided by bilateral donors uh, or philanthropies to achieve low-cost financing. And by uh, you know, taking advantage of this uh, low-cost financing, uh, the expected return of each uh, coal-fired power plant uh, could be achieved in shorter time horizon. That's how ETM could uh, let them retire early. Uh, we are piloting it, this ETM right now in the uh, Philippines, Indonesia, and also Vietnam. And our, especially our work in Indonesia is uh, truly uh, leading, uh, also in the context of its uh, G20 uh, presidency uh, this uh, year. And uh, I'm quite sure that this is going to be successful in the uh, Asian region. Uh, but so if that's the case, you know, uh, ATM can be duplicated in other parts of the world, like in African continent, South American continent, and I hope ATM would become one of the most powerful carbon reduction, reduction uh, model in the world. Mona Lisa, in the Philippines, electricity prices there uh, are among the highest in Southeast Asia because of your reliance on fossil fuels. Your country is participating in the ADB's ETM energy transition mechanism. How is implementation coming along? And you hopeful that this could help speed up energy transformation in your country? Thank you, Christine. Definitely. Uh, I think all of these initiatives are welcome. Um, there are also private banking institutions that have um, in one way or another uh, implemented their own form of ETM. And I know that there are there is at least one um, project company that has availed of, uh, of an ETM for one of the younger coal plants, as mentioned earlier. Uh, so it is going to be a very welcome, a very welcome initiative, definitely to address um, high prices that we are experiencing, similar to other parts of the world. Sindor, as, as one of the largest uh, renewable energy players in India, the transformation is already happening in your country. Investment going to renewables has hit a record high in India. Does this somehow drive down India's dependency on coal or are there still concerns that renewable energy might not be enough to meet growing energy demand in your country? Thank you, thank you, Christine. Um, so India, uh, while energy prices have um, you know, gone up in the world, India has really um, you know, taken note and it's an advantage and an opportunity for India on the renewable space. Um, as you know, Indian uh, solar industry has been a case study for the rest of the world just in the way the whole reverse auction system came into place and the manner in which the pricing went all the way down from 17 rupees per kilowatt hour to currently about 2.6 to 2.9 rupees per kilowatt hour. You know, as Mr. Birol mentioned, solar is really the way forward. Um, and, you know, with high energy prices and energy security being, um, you know, the most important um, goals for each of the countries today, India is um, potentially going to become an exporter because India has been blessed with the resources right from solar to the wind to hydro, uh, which would enable us to use these resources and renewables to go into the next frontiers of green hydrogen and green ammonia. So definitely, uh, you know, the 
there are very, very limited new coal power plants being uh, built out in India, and India has set a target of another 500 gigawatts by 2030, of which more than 50% is ex expected to come from only renewables. Um, so Indian government has, has a very clear roadmap for renewables, uh, with solar and wind being the way, but also green ammonia and green hydrogen opening up both in the domestic market as well as the international markets. Uh, just to let you know a little bit about the green hydrogen, the Indian government has come out with the green hydrogen uh, mission, uh, which is going to be replicated on similar lines of the solar mission. Um, so we see that, uh, you know, when Prime Minister Modi came into power, he did something quite unique. He brought in all the stakeholders, relevant stakeholders, like the state governments, the central government, developers such as ourselves, the financiers, the bankers, as well as private equity investors, on the same table to commit to the renewable purchase obligations. It's really that was what that kick-started the solar industry. And today we're seeing something very similar being done for green hydrogen. We're seeing um, hydrogen purchase obligations uh, come into play uh, as part of this new mission. So we see um, a much brighter and greener future for India. Uh, I would get some insights from Party. You heard what Sindor was talking about, about green hydrogen. Uh, from your point of view, from where you sit at the IEA, how reliable and how safe is green hydrogen as a, as a form of energy? I think there is a, a big promise for green hydrogen, especially in those countries uh, where you have the cheap uh, source of renewable energies. Solar is uh, number one here. And uh, my uh, colleague from India is uh, perfectly right. Today in India, if you compare uh, the cost of uh, solar PV and uh, the imported coal, solar is much cheaper. It is even cheaper than the domestic coal. So there is no reason, forget the environment, climate change, transformation, etc. Just for economic reasons, it makes more sense to go for solar. But there is one more thing I want to bring to your attention. Why do we build these power plants in India, Indonesia, in Japan, in China? Because the electricity demand is uh, growing, electricity consumption is growing. We have to build power plants to meet that demand growth. And, and if you look at that region, the number one, number one driver of electricity demand growth is air conditioners. And if you look at the developing Asia, only 10% of the households have an air conditioner, whereas in Japan or in United States, it is 90%. When the the income levels in Indonesia, India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan go up, they will buy air conditioners and they will um, drive the electricity consumption, rightly so, to have a much more comfortable life. Now comes the key issue, efficiency. Because it is a box, an air conditioning box in uh, Southeast Asia to provide the same comfort like in Japan, consumes three times more electricity because they are not efficient. If we can use air conditioners, manufacture them much more efficiently, we save electricity. Therefore, we need to build less power plants. It can be coal or solar or gas. So therefore, for me, yes, for uh, green hydrogen, yes, for solar, less for uh, uh, nuclear and others, but efficiency, energy efficiency comes first. President Asakawa, can I get your insights? The ADB is of the position that any energy transition in Asia has to be just, inclusive, and sustainable. Is it the role solely of governments to ensure that happens, or do we need to see strong public-private partnerships? Let me talk a little bit about just transition. You know, there are individuals, communities, uh, who are adversely affected uh, by low carbon transition. So we have to make sure that uh, nobody is left behind and, uh, and the cost and benefit of the transition should be uh, fair, uh, distributed fairly. And the affected uh, workers and the communities uh, should be protected uh, from any negative impact coming from cost by a transition process uh, through, for example, uh, appropriate uh, social welfare systems. And also they uh, need to uh, have access uh, to benefits transition 
uh, by uh, such as uh, building skills for green jobs. ADB is right now uh, trying to mobilize our resources to establish a just transition uh, platform uh, to support the MCs as they deploy uh, finance, uh, uh, climate financing uh, mechanisms provided by ADB and other developing, developing, development partners. And also, we are incorporating just transition uh, component into our uh, policies and operations. For example, the new energy policy, we, which we adopted last year, uh, clearly mentioned that uh, ADP is committed uh, to uh, support a just transition for all the people in the affected uh, communities. And also, uh, finally, uh, we are incorporating uh, a, a just in transition uh, component into the uh, detailed design of ETN, which I uh, explained earlier. Mona Lisa, uh, in the Philippines, I know this is something you constantly struggle with uh, as an energy regulator. What are some of the policies, the framework you're putting in place to ensure a just and inclusive transition to cleaner energy? There are many policies that we are putting in place. For the regulator, one thing that we are looking at at the moment is how do we revisit our framework for what we call least cost pricing in the system? Because so far, since the uh, deregulation of the industry in 2001, least cost pricing is so far um, determined on a per contract basis. But we know now, we know better that least cost does not really capture the full value of all the resources that are available, available in the system. For instance, while some renewable energies can be, um, in terms of capital investment, more expensive um, on a peso per kilowatt hour basis compared to uh, traditional sources, at the end of the day, because that, that um, facility will not be consuming uh, fuel or fuel costs, will not be incurring fuel costs, then that uh, there is, should be a premium that should be realized for those kinds of facilities that ultimately should be captured in the principle of least cost that we are um, adopting as a regulator. So that's, that's one of those. There's another that the Department of Energy is pursuing, which is um, uh, a reverse auction of sorts. It was mentioned earlier that in India, they really have pioneered and have been a success story for reverse auction. For the Philippines, we have done it only once um, earlier this year, but it was really successful. So I think the Department of Energy is pursuing another round of what we call green energy auction. Um, this is for uh, an award of concessions for, for green energy and um, offtake uh, for, for these capacities that are produced from renewable energy. Okay, so that's happening in, in the Philippines. What about India, Sindor? I mean, you develop many uh, solar and wind power plants uh, across India. Are you happy with the sort of regulations and the policies that you're seeing that governs this space? Is there anything more you want the government to do? I think the government is, um, you know, has come a long way specifically for renewables. Like I said, it's been a case study around the world, um, the way the solar uh, sector has really taken off. And the government does indeed support, um, you know, the sector in the form of, uh, firstly, they put in place something, um, the central government intermediary called the SECI uh, to ensure that um, developers such as ourselves have payment security uh, by tying up our PPAs with the intermediary, which is SECI, and that in, they in turn would then tie up with the state DISCOM. So it provides a layer of uh, payment security for us. Uh, the second thing that the government did um, you know, now, which is doing right now, is uh, putting in place um, the PLI scheme, which is production-linked uh, incentives for manufacturing. Um, you know, as you know, one of the larger challenges that we will see coming uh, up in the future is going to be on the supply chain uh, constraint side. So we, we currently are dependent on just one country for, um, you know, solar panels. And the government of India is very cognizant of the fact that solar manufacturing now needs to be done domestically. And uh, to that uh, extent, they're supporting the sector with a PLI of $3 billion. So they're supporting that in the form of incentives. Of course, there are challenges. What we would like to see further from the government is, um, is probably one is around structural reforms because currently uh, the power sector is, a, is on the concurrent list, which basically means both the state and the central government have equal legislative powers over it, and they sometimes don't quite see eye to eye. Um, but the government did something quite successfully in the area of taxation with the GST reforms and by putting together a joint panel between the center and state. 
And I think there are ways to solve the structural um, problem by having a joint sort of uh, power sector council to, to govern uh, reforms around the sector. Um, uh, I think these are some of the things that we're looking forward to, but I think the government is doing a, a fairly great job of setting up uh, things like the ISTS network, which is the intra interstate transmission network. In order for these large capacities to come online, we need an extremely strong power grid, and the government is putting in large investments to connect these grids. Um, so these are some of the things the government has been um, putting in place just for renewables primarily. Fatih, I, I know you're constantly talking to government officials and policymakers. What are you advising them in terms of policy framework and guidelines on how to encourage investment and growth in the renewable space? I do believe uh, Asia, again, mainly developing Asia, uh, needs to be one of the driver of the clean energy transition. And this is uh, very important. This is not only to address the climate change that we all uh, are facing. This is not because uh, the Asia has a big share in the global emissions. This is one part of it. But the second part, what I tell the government leaders uh, in Asia, if Asian economies want to prepare themselves for the next chapter of the global economy, modern global economy, they have to be drivers of the clean energy transitions. I cannot think of uh, countries in 20, 30 years of time leading the uh, global economic growth at the same time relying on coal and the traditional cars. Solar is growing, wind, uh, the hydrogen, Efficiency, electric cars, they are growing uh, very, very strongly. A new global energy economy is emerging. And the Asian uh, developing nations forget the climate change, forget the environment, just for the sake of their economic growth, a sustainable economic uh, growth. They have to uh, be putting policies in place to have a clean and secure energy transition. Otherwise, uh, they will be part of the obsolete uh, economy while the other uh, countries are uh, moving in the uh, clean uh, economy. So this is my main advice I am giving to governments, not only climate change environment, but mainly for their very economic interests, for their citizens, for their population. They have to push clean energy transition and provide right investment frameworks, incentives, as we are seeing everywhere. When you look at United States today, major inflation reduction act, 400 billion US dollar, Japan, a green transformation program, Europe, recover EU, China is moving, India, we are uh, uh, getting every day very impressive numbers, but other countries also in developing Asia move to be a part of the emerging uh, clean energy system. Fatih, from where you sit at the IEA, is there a country that you're looking at that would be a driver, a key leader of clean technology? In your view, which country would that be? I think in the world, there are many countries who are doing a very good job. And in Asia, there are, uh, I was recently in uh, uh, Indonesia for the uh, G20 summit and Indonesia is doing a good work. But I have been very impressed what the Indian government is doing since a long time. R uh, ranging from uh, providing access to energy for uh, tens of millions of people in a very short period of time in the villages uh, to uh, efficient lighting in the streets, providing the uh, uh, clean cooking. Uh, tens of millions of women and children uh, in the Ujwala program in uh, India and uh, in the renewable energy area India is making major, uh, major steps in the right direction. Is, it, uh, is there still uh, work to do in India? Yes, definitely. But uh, I see that India is making uh, good steps in the right direction, a country that we can all uh, learn from. And it appears we have just lost the camera from the IEA, but let's continue our discussion with the rest of the panelists. President Asakawa, as a whole, energy financing really still greatly exceeds the current investment uh, in Asia. Apart from the ETM, what else is the ADB exploring? How else can the ADB help make up the shortfall? Honestly speaking, it has been sometimes uh, argued uh, that the ADB should uh, you know, focus on 
uh, immediate uh, COVID-19 response and other you know, challenges we are currently facing and uh, are putting less priority on medium to long term uh, development agenda like climate change. So whenever I hear this kind of argument, I always you know, uh, wonder why we have to choose either of them. Uh, because I think the short term measures and long term measures are not mutually exclusive. For example, as the global you know, economy recovers from pandemic, I'm quite certain uh, that uh, the uh, GHG, uh, green ga greenhouse gas emission, uh, will in inevitably increase. And they have increased already. Uh, so th these two things, uh, short-term measures and long-term strategy, are linked to each other. Rather, uh, we see our you know, COVID response and so on as an opportunity to transform our economy towards more uh, green development. Uh, last year was the year of COP26, so I went to Glasgow. Uh, before I went there, uh, we discussed the inside, in, in, internally, you know, ADB, uh, what, what kind of contribution sh uh, could be uh, made uh, to uh, support the COP process. And we uh, made one very important uh, decision concerning our climate financing, uh, which is, you know, we decided to elevate our ambition uh, from $80 billion to $100 billion of cumulative uh, climate financing from 2019 to 2030 for those 12 years. So $100 billion climate financing for 12 years. That's a huge, huge amount and a big challenge for us. But, but also we see our investment in green growth as an opportunity uh, to keep advancing your development, uh, to reduce poverty while maintaining our path uh, to low carbon transition. And finally, let me add, uh, Christine, uh, that this region has been you know, facing uh, increasing climate shocks. Uh, you know, quite recently we saw what happened in Pakistan, right? Uh, so we clearly recognize the need to increase our investment not only in mitigation but also in adaptation as well. Adaptation. So out of this $100 you know, uh, billion dollars ambition, we also intend uh, to in invest $34 billion uh, dollars in adaptation, which is another very important component of climate financing. You say the role of technology is going to be key. So how else is the ADB working with developing member countries to improve their access to data and the latest clean technologies? Technology transfer is really important. And the innovation uh, is a key uh, to uh, increase the share of renewable energy in the energy policy mix. And uh, actually, uh, technology is uh, required in many aspects of renewable energy uh, project, like a business model, uh, innovative financing and uh, uh, market design, uh, system or, uh, operation, and so on. So we are most happy uh, to you know, uh, uh, support uh, those technology transfer uh, to uh, developing countries and emerging economies uh, so that their action uh, towards decarbonization would be accelerated. Mona Lisa, let me come to you as the energy regulator in the Philippines. Uh, what sort of funds, what sort of financing are you tapping on to ensure uh, a just and inclusive transition into cleaner energy uh, in the Philippines. As a regulator, we an, enjoy the support of um, of ADB, of other uh, of other multilaterals in um, increasing our capacity so that we can regulate more effectively. So in that sense, we also are beneficiaries to the green financing that's that's uh, flowing uh, to to government. But I think more importantly, um, maybe not as a regulator, but for, for developers, for the Department of Energy as well, there is a lot of support coming from these institutions. And it's not just uh, international institutions, local, um, local banks are quite, are quite liquid as well and really declaring their commitment to wean themselves away from their coal financing and moving funds to, um, to green projects, to renewable energy projects. We see this all over the world and, we, and the Philippines is not, is not uh, insulated from, from these developments in banks as well as um, in, the insurance, uh, in the insurance sector. Sindor, let me get your take. Um, do you think India can be the leader when it comes to green technology, energy technology? Do you think it has what it takes to lead in this space for the region? Yes, absolutely. I'm a firm believer, um, and especially in the last few years, um, uh, India has introduced something called the ALMM. It's an approved list 
of uh, module manufacturers as well as um, you know it's put in place safeguards duties just in order to encourage local technology and local manufacturing primarily we are going to see a large uptake in the solar manufacturing uh, side um, you know large companies have made announcements um, including ourselves of putting up gigawatts of uh, cell and module capacity and these are all going to be new generation technology so uh, you know a lot of money is now going into the r d to ensure that you know we are completely uh, self-dependent and on this uh, on the second um, sa side i think the other part is the electrolyzer manufacturing which is basically going to be used for the green hydrogen and green ammonia piece i think here we see a little bit of a bottleneck when it comes to um, technology sharing and perhaps we would look at uh, other countries to open source this uh, platform currently uh, in order to get electrolyzer technology and um, also on the green ammonia space uh, these technologies are licensed to very few players they hold these licenses so we are looking forward to open sourcing these uh, so the whole world uh, can start using these technologies and really move to the next phase which is that of green hydrogen and green ammonia and we see India playing a large role in these. Sindo, when you see what you've done in the solar space uh, in the wind space I mean obviously what you do requires a lot of land Right. Uh, how big a challenge is that to secure that piece of land, that size of land in India, when you have presumably, I would assume, thousands of homeowners on that land? I'm sure the negotiation process must be so tedious. So absolutely, um, you know, uh, just to give you a perspective, uh, we have the largest solar power plant that we set up earlier this year. It's the largest in the world, about uh, 1,250 megawatts. Um, just to give you a perspective, that's roughly half the size of New Delhi. So you can imagine, um, you know, the size of the solar power plant. Um, and, and you're absolutely right, you know, these are um, areas that are, you know, some of these are actually just barren lands and our aim is to try to go into these desert regions. So, for example, this plant is in Rajasthan, which is a desert uh, in, in Bikaner, which is a desert region of India. So a large part, um, you know, is, is just barren land. So that's easier. Uh, I think the issue sometimes is when you have to, um, you know, get land for transmission uh, infrastructure and I think the government has been fairly helpful in working with us and uh, we work a lot with the local communities um, you know on the social and community engagement side uh, to ensure that we're giving back in terms of employment in terms of you know empowering um, students we set up uh, a lot of um, social uh, projects in these regions just to ensure that there's a lot of economic development so people understand that you know while they're selling their land the whole a community is benefiting and there's a greater good um, you know that that is coming in in that area so we work very closely with communities uh, to do that and I think the um, you know the government is understanding that uh, this is going to be an imperative uh, to build renewables in the future so they're setting up large solar parks for developers such as ourselves so in the future we are seeing more developers go to these solar parks where the government itself is you know, setting up the basic infrastructure, including the land. President Asokawa, so far you've picked Philippines and Indonesia to be part of your ETM. Uh, and you talked about scalability to the rest of the region. What other countries is the ADB wanting to explore to include in the ATM? As I mentioned, uh, we are right now you know, piloting on those three countries only. But we got kind of you know, very strong interest from other countries as well, including India and Pakistan and so on. And uh, we are still, you know, uh, trying to, you know, uh, talking to the donors uh, to get the necessary amount of, you know, hi either high concession of fi uh, financing or uh, grant money uh, to make AT ETM happen. Uh, so uh, we don't know how, how large ETM we can, you know, establish uh, finally uh, as of today, but uh, we would like to you know, expand uh, the opportunity of ATM as, uh, for as many as, uh, countries as possible. And as, as I mentioned before, you know, this cannot be monopolized only in here, here uh, in Asian region. This should be really replicated by other parts of the world. Uh, because I do believe that ETM is a really, really you know, powerful and efficient uh, mechanism uh, to accelerate the decarbonization process. Could you uh, move beyond retiring just coal plants and retiring these really old furnace, oil, power plants as well? I is that something the ADB is looking at to include in your ETM? 
Uh, right now, you know, uh, because of the you know, uh, size of the fund, I don't think you know, we could go that far. Uh, but uh, a basic idea uh, to you know, rely on uh, branded financing, you know, both uh, on commercial money and public money, uh, to make uh, you know, expected return from any project uh, be achieved in a shorter period of time. That can be applied to any kind of you know, project. So theoretically speaking, Christine, as you mentioned, it could be expanded to other sources of the energies in the future. Mona Lisa, you work closely with the Department of Energy. Do you foresee uh, any challenges, any change in policy, any framework that could potentially quicken the transformation, the energy transformation in the Philippines in a big way? Is there something coming along the pipeline that we should be aware of? I can think of two immediately because these are things that we worked on when I was still at the National Renewable Energy Board. The first is increasing the RPS, the Renewable Portfolio Standard. This is a, like a minimum uh, volume that off-takers should get from renewable energy sources. Currently, we are, uh, it is set at 1% of the total sales of distribution utilities. So they should get from renewable energies one, at least 1% of, of the volume that they supply to their consumers. This volume we have recommended to be increased to 2.52% um, by 2023. That this is the way to get us back on track, as I mentioned earlier, to 35% RE by 2030. So this one, we are um, anticipating the Department of Energy to, to issue this. The second one is a Department of Energy initiative that eventually will, will find its way to, to, our, um, to our side of the fence, to the regulator side of the fence. And this is in respect of the transmission system, preparing the grid for, um, in order to the grid to accept or uh, to connect all these renewable energy projects. That there is a study um, commissioned with, by the Department of Energy with the U.S. National Renewable Energy Laboratory called the CREST study, the Competitive Renewable Energy Zones. There are 35 zones all over the Philippines that have been identified as very rich in solar, wind, and hydro, uh, hydro potential. And this study already identified the upgrades that the grid requires in order to take on all these capacities that are potentially can, that potentially can be developed and can, can, supply the, can supply the system. So immediately these two um, initiatives, uh, we are waiting for, for development. And I'm, I'm confident that in the next few months, we will see movement along these lines. And these are, these are key because this is, just, this is not just talking about a market, um, that will be created for more renewable energy capacities, but physically preparing the grid to, um, to accept all these capacities that will be built. Can Asia make a successful transition to clean energy without China on board? Because we've seen and we've heard how many countries in Asia are making great strides in trying to change the narrative, in trying to change the way things are done on the energy front and, and how we deliver energy. But China, we know, has so far said that they're going to stop any investment in new coal plants outside of China, but within China itself, they are still firing up because there is energy demand, increasing energy demand they need to cater to. President Asakawa, do you think Asia can, can do a successful energy transition without China on board, without China being fully on board? Yeah, I think you know, China itself recognizes the need for decarbonization. So we don't have to preach to China what to do. And also China has ample you know, domestic resource, resources, finances by themselves. Uh, so they might not, not need in huge, huge, you know, uh, external uh, financing as assistance uh, to do so. So I def definitely think, uh, think uh, that you know uh, the, uh, uh, to the, uh, to involve uh, the China into our discussion about decarbonization in Asia as a whole uh, is very, very unnecessary, and we cannot uh, consider any uh, decarbon decarbonized Asia without China. And finally, my panelists, I would like to get your final thoughts about the sort of leadership that's needed to ensure a successful energy transition here in Asia, one that meets emission reduction targets, one that caters to rising demand in a just and inclusive manner. President Asakawa, can we start with you first? What sort of leadership is needed to drive change in this space? I think this is about time uh, to turn policy into concrete action. 
For example, a number of countries have set the very ambitious uh, net zero uh, targets, uh, which is encouraging. Uh, but actually, uh, the uh, progress on establishment of concrete action plan to achieve those goals remains very slow, very slow. For example, only a handful of ADB member countries have provided so-called LTS, long-term uh, GHG, uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, development strategy, uh, by the way, which is uh, uh, required to do so under the Paris Agreement. So in the next uh, couple of years, uh, countries should uh, make uh, substantial progress in you know, introducing concrete action plan uh, to accelerate uh, the decarbonization uh, process. And ADB is more than happy uh, to support uh, those countries' uh, effort to do so, based on the firm recognition that the low carbon transition or transition to uh, renewable clean energy sources is fully compatible uh, with uh, a resilient, robust, and sustainable uh, economic growth. Mona Lisa, what's your take? What sort of leadership do we need to ensure a successful transition here in Asia? I think it, it would take a, a leader who, is, who has courage. Um, I think the information is there, the information is available. Um, it may it already be presenting itself to us, but it still takes courage to make the right decisions and make the right call at the right time. Um, especially for a developing country like the Philippines, there are always cost implications and there are unpopular decisions that need to be made in order to move us along this transition. So I think courage would be the, the key character that would be required of a leader that would take us along this transition. Mm. And, and finally, Sindor, what kind of leadership do you think is needed to ensure Asia's energy transition is done in a successful way? I think we have an extremely strong and visionary leader in the form of our Prime Minister Modi. Um, he understands solar and clean energy uh, better than most of us. Um, and he has really sort of led the way for um, a, a clean future. Just, um, you know, a couple of points here again. Uh, India has currently got the third largest renewable energy base in the world, the third largest installations um, in the world. And, um, you know, along with that, uh, the new framework that India has set up for green hydrogen, it is one of the first few countries to put into place um, a, a strong policy around green hydrogen and a strong regulatory framework around it. So uh, I think unlike the West where uh, most of the industrialization was powered by dirty fuel, India is going to see a different path. Uh, you know, as we get industrialized every day, as the manufacturing increases, uh, this is going to be powered by green energy, solar energy, and India is extremely committed to a green hydrogen future now. And in terms of financing, in terms of money, the private sector will continue to lead the way in India? I think so. The private sector, as well as some government, like I mentioned, the REC and the PFC are government banks. There are public sector banks as well. Um, the domestic bond markets and from the equity side, we do have now, uh, you know, the NIIF, which is uh, sponsored by the government, as well as uh, foreign sovereign funds, energy transition funds. I think we have, um, you know, multilateral agencies like uh, ADB. Uh, there's um, enough financing available for the right projects um, and the you know, right set of developers. And there we have to leave it. Thank you so much for your thoughts and your insights. Special thanks to the IEA's Fatih Bureau, President Matsusugu Asakawa, Mona Lisa Di Malanta, and Sindor Mittal. Thank you so much for being with me today. <laughs>